Welcome to today's webinar, Streamline Enterprise Authoring and Feedback with SDL Tridian Docs. My name is Jeff and I will be your host. Your speakers today are Chip Gettinger, SDL VP Global Solutions, and Joe Pearman, SDL Senior Product Manager. <clears throat> we expect today's webinar will last about 30 to 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. If you have any questions, then please enter them into the Q&A box. I will now pass you over to Joe to begin the presentation. Thanks very much, Jeff. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, so today we've got uh, quite a packed agenda. We're going to go through some highlights of recent releases um, and with particular focus on the collective spaces environment, the kind of easy but powerful authoring for subject matter experts um, and also, of course, cross-enterprise review. Um, so all new environment for that and we go into some depth. Uh, Chip will show a demo of this. Um, and then we'll come back to some roadmap items in various different areas. And in particular, uh, a walk into what we're planning around the whole kind of uh, high for content or semantic AI area. So let's start with a few highlights of what we've done over the recent releases. Um, so one particular feature was the concept mashups, um, where we can now publish uh, from Trillion Sites and Trillion Docs onto exactly the same page, and it's all aggregated automatically. So it's not combined with um, uh, kind of hard links, but it's all kind of automatic based on similar subject matter, based on taxonomy. Uh, you're seeing everything aggregated on a page. We also had, of course, the much faster publishing stream. Um, so people seeing improvements in publishing time of up to double even it can be uh, for very large publications. We streamlined the content importing process uh, with an all new content importer tool, um, improved UX, um, but also uh, using it for importing translated files. So if you don't have a connection to our language technology, to TMS or World Server, or language cloud, then this is the ability to directly uh, import the translated files that you've translated elsewhere. We also introduced some good productivity enhancements for technical authors, uh, such as the ability to search for publications within Publication Manager um, and to get the Ditter OT logs directly and a few other things like that. Made some back-end improvements to make configurability easier and upgrades a bit quicker added platform supports, um, Windows Server 2019, SQL Server 2019, Oracle 19C, Oracle Java 11, and also client tools, of course, Oxygen 21 and XMetal 14. And then, of course, the big story for a number of releases, if you've been following some of our um, some of our announcements and webinars and things, has been around collective spaces, which with the release of Tridian Docs 14 SP2, as of just about a couple of weeks ago, um, is now kind of, I would say, very mature, very streamlined kind of environment to use. So we're going to go into some depth on that now. So the point about collective space, space is really being that increasingly we're hearing from customers and the market in general that subject matter experts are really part of the content team now. They're no longer kind of outside contributors writing a little bit of text that then the proper authors kind of massage and get into the real content. Very much of the time, they're, they're taking a more lead role in, in actually creating content in helping to shape it and, of course, passing it through the review workflow as well. And when I say subject matter experts, I mean, I'm talking about professionals in all sorts of different areas. Could be engineers, could be accountants, could be lawyers, could be doctors, all sorts of professionals who are very good at their jobs, who have obviously done some very advanced writing in their careers and studies, um, but they just don't necessarily have the time to become experts in technical authoring tools. So it needs to be an easy tool, but not kind of dumbed down in any way. They need, they need some power behind this. They need to do real work. So flashing back, so this is the challenge we recognized for, for a good few years. Um, and what we presented at our Connect event in 2018 was really the picture of the traditional workflow uh, where you would have for auth authoring the trained tech authors kind of piecing together these bits of concept Lego and figure figuring out their dependencies. And as I said, you know, SMEs were contributing just little chunks of text typically. 
reviewing tended to be a bit of a headache on the whole. Um, so tech authors would publish out something from this nice single source system, publish it out to PDF or Word, and from there on it became a mess. Uh, many, many different comments on different documents. People were relying on Excel to track things. And of course, we and other vendors had um, developed ways to try and approach this online, uh, but generally they weren't terribly scalable. So really in, in the market, um, there was a new way of working needed. So fast forward a little bit, and this is what we've got now. This environment collect collectively called collector spaces. So the draft space being the editor. Um, where I say substantially creating and updating content. So again, it's not just little chunks. You're scrolling through the whole publication. Uh, you're moving things about if you want, and really having a kind of a lead role in creating content according, of course, to the permissions assigned you to the role. So we still base all of this on, on the DocCM that you know, on all the rules and uh, permissions that you know. Um, but of course, if you're allowed to do that, then you get a lot more control than you used to. And then review space as well, uh, which requires less. So it's pretty easy to get up to speed in draft space, but review space, it's even easier. With kind of a half hour briefing, we reckon you're going to be up to speed as a reviewer here. Um, but again, doing some real work. You're commenting, of course, but you're checking the resolutions of your comments. Um, you're approving them. And you're also able to work with the workflow on the actual topics themselves, provided, of course, that your permissions allow you to. And this is not to say that this is all replacing what's gone before, it's supplementing it and making it available to new kind of user roles. So always going to need the professional authors, if you like, the power users. But just to say in many organizations now, the ratio is somewhat flipped. So whereas you might have previously needed a very large team of tech authors and just have a few kind of trusted contributors, that's really flipped now and say, you only need really a few of these power users um, to do the very heavy duty kind of stuff there, checking the XML sometimes or wrangling the bits of the workflow or whatever it may be. Uh, but a lot of the real content work can be done now by SMEs. And another quick flashback. So this was the timeline we established over October 2019. Not greatly different from what we announced at Connects uh, 2018, but this is exactly what we'd got in October 2019. Um, uh, of course, it was easy to say uh, Trillion Docs 14. It was always it was already out by then, but we set ourselves quite a challenge uh, for SP1 with the whole kind of reviewing functionality around that, plus the API to access that data, plus a whole new kind of um, easy but powerful configuration layer about su supporting data specializations in this environment. And then, of course, looking ahead, we promised to by spring 20 release an SP2. Um, which we would so put in Docs 14 SP2, including a document history module uh, to see exactly what was changed and when and where in content um, and bring even more powerful reviewing. That's what we committed to, and that's exactly what we're able to deliver. Um, and, you know, without wanting to sound too kind of uh, proud about it, but, but I am proud, to be honest. I'm very proud that the team has pulled this together. Um, as many people will know, software is kind of a, a hard thing to tame sometimes, um, scopes creep and all of this kind of stuff. But we, we've kept a scope, we've kept the timing, and we've delivered exactly what we said we would do. And some of my slides, I'm afraid, are a little bit information heavy today. Uh, we'll make all the slides available, of course, as well as the recording, as, as Jeff said. Um, so I won't go into huge depth here, but there's really quite some depth to these features, and you'll see some of this later in Chip's demo. So worth having a better look through this. I just presented the highlights before. And just to mention another fairly information heavy slide, but you may be thinking, well, what's different from the old collaborative review? And I would say basically everything, uh, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, it is a completely different tool. It does many things better. It does some things that the old tools never did, and it expands to whole new kind of user personas and use cases. So worth having a look through this later, I would say, at your leisure. So in just a minute, I believe we're going to swip, swap over to Chip and see his demo of this new environment. Thanks, Chip. Great. Thanks, Joe, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, nice to see everyone today. Welcome to our webinar. And uh, it, 
Joe, it has been an exciting journey since the original SCL Connect 2018. Uh, and congratulations to the, the R&D team for, you know, committing and releasing on time. It's a significant upgrade and many of our SCL customers have been looking forward to this. Um, so some of you may have not seen uh, Collective Spaces. I wanted to give a really brief demo today on highlighting some of the new feature that Joe has been, uh, new features Joe's been talking about. We do have full demos on the SDL community, so it's community.sdl.com. But let me jump right in. Um, I'm in Firefox right now. I'm just gonna go full screen so uh, you can see a little bit more. So this is review space. And as Joe mentioned, this is really the uh, user experience that uh, SCL has created uh, for subject matter experts to review content. So one of the first things you notice is, this is a, a sales guide that I'm working on and collaborating with my team, is I can simply just scroll down and I see all the content uh, in, in uh, context. So uh, for the sharp eyed, you can see these are various topics or, or, or documents as we call them here. But these are the same topics for single sourcing from the Tridian Docs uh, repository. So the user experience is really wonderful. We really heard a lot of feedback over the years from our customers and prospects about the ability to see this in context. So let's take a little uh, a look now a little bit at what's new with the new Service Pack 2. So um, one of the things you'll notice is, is that each one of these uh, topics has a workflow status. So what's new in this release is the ability for me to simply scroll through and find which uh, uh, these components do I need to review and so forth. And so, uh, draft space, or I'm sorry, review space quickly jumps me to, for example, this elevator pitch and I can read through it. And then as a reviewer, I have the option to say, okay, that looks great. I'm gonna just say that's, you know, work change the workflow status. Now, for those of you that use uh, our traditional, uh, you know, uh, uh, client tools, these are the workflow statuses that appear within Publication Manager, Oxygen, and XMetal. So we're single sourcing this off the same repository, so that would change the workflow status back for anyone that's using it. Now, to get a little bit more advanced, um, I'm going to go look at some of the comments that have been going on. So for those of you that have seen uh, past demos, we have very uh, powerful capabilities within our commenting capabilities. Um, so for example, I can see this guy Chip has a comment going on here. I can also click on other comments. Oh, and there's suggested changes too. We'll come back to that in a bit. Um, but one of the things I really like about the Service Pack 2 is we, we group together comments uh, very nicely. So uh, the comments are based around the particular topics that are uh, in, in context. So we've really helped in navigation. Uh, another nice feature is the outline view. The outline view is the uh, more or less the, the structure of the content. And one of my favorite features is the ability to quickly find, let's say a topic around benefits. And so a uh, very quick navigation way to jump around um, and add in information and so forth. So we also heard from customers that, um, you know, commenting can get complex. Um, Joe brought up some really great use cases in our last webinar in December. And we, and, and this release have added the capability to filter comments. So uh, I can filter on the type, who created it, uh, creation dates, and more importantly, whether this comment has been resolved or unresolved. So by being able to filter content, it's much easier than to focus in and look at particular areas and so forth. Um, one other small feature we added is the ability to go in and add comments on images within the content. And so I can simply click on it and I can add a comment and then I can come over here and I can say, please update this. And then I can say, this is a general and then save that to the area. So the last thing that we can do then also is go in and um, 
use a search method. So search is now available. We have a number of customers who have very large publications. Um, so I can actually find uh, all the particular uh, topics within this publication. And I can use this as a way to navigate through and find different areas and so forth. And some nice ability to, let's say, match the case, and then I can search and so forth. And a little preview in draft space, the authoring, the SME authoring, I can also do replace, which we'll show that in a minute. So, um, so that's kind of really quick overview. Let's now uh, switch gears here. And I'm going to now switch into draft space, which is the SME authoring environment. And this I'm going to use uh, standard Chrome. So I'm gonna go full screen here so we get to see a little bit more uh, real estate and what's going on. So draft space is, as Joe said, really is our scalable, uh, powerful, uh, but easy authoring environment. And in other demos people uh, that uh, we've shown, uh, you have menus that have come up at the top within draft space, which provide the functionality and authoring and structured authoring. I'm not gonna go through these today. They're, they're available on, on other demos, but I did wanna highlight some of the new capabilities that um, we have within the uh, draft space. So one of my favorites, again, is the ability to do this quick navigation. So I can search uh, and actually go to this market opportunity and it would take me directly there. The other thing you'll notice is the outline view now is collapsed. So if I'm actually going down into topics and so forth, it automatically will expand out as I get into the area and so forth. So some other kind of uh, capabilities that we have is the ability to see the comments that are coming in from the review space user. So draft space also includes the reviewing capabilities. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all the different options here. They're pretty, uh, pretty extensive. But one new feature we have is this editorial suggestion. So one of the things that we've heard uh, feedback from our customers is there's different type of review cycles. And in this particular area, what I can do, for example, is I want to go in and the original uh, reviewer actually said, well, you know, I have some new information. So I now can just basically copy their suggested content and then paste that into uh, my content. So we greatly simplified that. And I also now have the ability to resolve this comment. And I can say, this is fixed and I can say it's applied, and then I can say done. So comments also have metadata associated with them. And in other webinars, we talk about how that could be used for reporting and other aspects within the system. So um, a couple of other quick, nice things. Um, the ability to see uh, the Tridian Docs variables have been greatly improved within draft space. And this is the more advanced capabilities that uh, for those of you using Tridian Docs, I can see that, for example, X design is in fact a variable within the system. And what's new now is I can choose to edit that and I can also show the source or the uh, library file, the resource that is the source that that's coming from. And we're getting feedback that these kind of capabilities are more important uh, for SMEs, but as you can see, it's a very clean, easy to use interface. There's a number of other usability enhancements that uh, my team really loves around uh, speed and performance. We can also see conditional content here. Um, we can also change the conditional content values. That's a new capability. Um, so a couple of other things, um, and, and this is for the, the, the diehards, but we now can actually see the XML structure view. So while we're never gonna see a tags on view, uh, we did add in the ability to see the underlying XML that's in use and so forth for users. Um, we continue to have the properties dialogue, which lists in the workflows and so forth. Um, but again, one of my nice favorite features is the search um, and so forth. So I have the ability to come in and search for market um, and I can see I've got, um, well, I wanna match my case and I wanna do a whole word search 
and then I can run the search again. And now I have the ability to come in and say, okay, we're going to call this sales now. And then I can go through and replace these. Um, and then uh, DraftSpace does the right thing. If the topic is released, it lets me go in and create the new version if I need to. So um, as Joe can tell you, I can go on and on here for quite some time, but a couple of last things I wanna show and then hand it back to Joe is Joe mentioned what we call deep linking. So one of the features we heard back from our customers is the ability to create a link to this particular topic. So essentially, if I want Joe to review this topic, I could say, copy that link to review space. I could then email that to him. And when he clicks on it and logs into the system, and by the way, it's the same single sign-on you use with Tradian Docs, Review Space would navigate Joe directly to that particular topic for review. Um, okay, so one new feature that we have with, um, with DraftSpace is called Document History. We've heard over the years that many of our customers really want to be able to see the changes between uh, revisions of content as you're collaborating. And as you can see, I just called up show changes dialog, and this is the new document history feature, which just got released a few weeks ago. So document history is showing me the changes that Nigel, Sarah, and I have been working on, the revision changes within this particular version of the topic. And I can simply select a particular range that I want to see, you know, what the heck's been going on over this time period. And then when I click on view changes, I can instantly see the track changes of this information. I also see a list over here of what the changes have been over time, who made them and so forth. I can also see my timeline here, which I could change if I wanted to. Um, but the nice feature is, is that if I want to, um, from document history, I can jump right back into uh, the document and it takes me right to the point where uh, that particular information, and you know what, actually I'm gonna change this to 14.8%. And, you know, so it's very easy for me as a, as a author, a semi-author to make these changes and so forth. One last feature, and then I'm gonna pass it back to you, Joe. Um, the, the last thing that we did and I wanna make sure I get the right window here. Let's see, here we go. So the last feature is the ability for review space to review the target languages that have been returned back from your translation management system. So here's that same um, publication that I've been doing. And oh, look, it's even telling me that uh, someone else is working on this. So review space, draft space work together really nicely when you're going on. But what I see here is the translated Spanish content. And I also can change the workflow statuses if, for example, I wanna reject this particular uh, translation. And then that would send an uh, indicator back to the translation management system. Hey, there needs to be uh, something fixed here. I also have the ability to come in and add comments uh, to this particular uh, language and so forth. So the comments are unique just to the Spanish language. So um, a lot more there, but Joe, um, I'm gonna hand it back to you um, to uh, continue on with the slides. Thanks, Chip. Great demo. So just before I get into uh, kind of future roadmap, because as a product manager, I'm always living kind of three months to three years in the future. Um, and it's hard to just kind of take stock of where we are right now. But I would say this is actually, as of this uh, Trillion Docs 14 SP2 release, um, this is a very kind of mature and well worked out and thoroughly tested product at this time. I mean, we've been through numerous kind of user tests. Chip and his team have done workshops. I've done usability tests um, in terms of technical testing. We have the bank, whole bank of tests we always did, but we've added in another layer of automation on top of that. So the testing is better than it's ever been. So I would just say that, you know, what we have right now is a, is a fantastically kind of mature and powerful release. And I, I would strongly urge everybody to, if you're not already considering your upgrade, then do get in touch with your account manager and, and start discussing it. 
But moving along, I mean, we're always interested in what's coming next. And so first of all, some thoughts around collective spaces itself. So this is kind of a chance to take stock now. Um, <clears throat> So we have this mature release out um, and people are going to start using it more in the wild and really um, giving us more and more feedback. You know, we've been into production with various various people already and got some great feedback. But I think as people just use it more and more, they're going to want it to become more powerful and do some different things. So this is a great time to give feedback. And um, I have a, a next slide, which indicates some areas we're already looking at. But I just wanted to indicate, you know, with this kind of product overview we have to take, there's always a balance. Um, so clearly the simplicity and the in intuitiveness that Chip has just demonstrated, we don't want to lose that. But nevertheless, we want it to make make it powerful enough to do uh, a good job for people doing it with various use cases. Similarly, you know, we want to give people a certain amount of control of, over how I've, ever it works um, and have a certain design approach to say this is the way it works best. Nevertheless, there has to be a degree of flexibility, obviously data specializations, but also the way it's picking up your workflow, the way you choose to make it work for your, your organization. So it's all a balance. And if we go too far in any direction, you know, we will get these kind of comments that I've indicated at the edge of this slide. So. Um, if it is too simple and locked down, then people will feel it just can't be adopted to their own workflow. Um, if it's locked down and overly complex, you might say, well, it's just over-engineered. If it's com highly complex and highly flexible, ultimately it just becomes unmanageable and we can't guarantee you the same great experience and quality that we would always do. And it even becomes more complex to upgrade. And then, you know, if it's simple and but overly flexible, but it doesn't have enough features, then that's also a problem. So we, there's, there's got to be a balance. And I'm just maybe exaggerating a little bit, um, but these would be the things to avoid. So we're trying to aim somewhere nicely in the middle that does a really good job for the vast majority of customers um, and hits most of your needs. So these are some areas that we're already starting to look at for further enhancements. Um, but as I say at the bottom here, um, we have this community ideas board, which we do check sometimes more often than others, but I have an initiative to really get some more kind of activity there. Um, uh, so please do use that community ideas board to, first of all, check what people have suggested already um, for feature enhancements and to add your own use cases to those or add votes for the ones that you like. And secondly, of course, for things that you don't see there that you feel will be really valuable for the products, then do post them and do encourage other people to, to chime in as well, because that's really, really useful. Um, clearly, you know, if it looks like something that will only ever benefit one organization with a very specialized case, it's, it's trickier to prioritize. Um, but if we can start to see that kind of wider support that this really makes sense for a number of customers, then we will do our best to prioritize that. And as always, you know, it's, it's great to get any kind of ideas. And the ones that are most helpful, I would say, are the ones that are focused on your use case. What, what's the pain this is trying to solve? So not necessarily exactly how it could look, um, design ideas and so on, but what's the f fundamental kind of pain or the, the use case that you're trying to do with it? That's really useful. So a few ideas here. Um, a lot of people would like a kind of actionable accept button. We already have a copy and paste from review suggestions into the editor, which is good. And of course, you, a lot of authors will always want to have that final kind of a check of what's been added by reviewers to make sure it conforms to guidelines and everything. But a lot of people are asking for an accept button that actually makes the change directly. That would be interesting. It's technically very challenging in some ways um, if you think about the underlying tags and you could be making suggestions across uh, block element boundaries and all sorts of things. Technically challenging, but we're looking into it. Um, taxonomy tag suggestions, something very active. We'll chat a little bit about that later. Dashboards on what to review or even looking at whole publication approvals, um, even things like, is it a group that we assign this to? Um, and then you might say just one per person needs to sign off on the work that's been done. or Maybe it's the whole group or maybe it's a majority. So all of this kind of stuff. Thoughts around spell checking, quality analysis, broader change tracking perhaps. So Chip clearly showed the power of what we do have with document history. Um, would we like to extend that to review space? Would we like to have a quicker and perhaps le less in-depth view that goes across the whole publication? Um, 
and all sorts of things like that, even down to the more technical features. So chip showed previewing a variable, of course. The question might be, do we actually want to edit or insert variables to some degree? With power comes responsibility, as they say. Uh, so we have to think very carefully about how this would work with the product. But we're looking at all of this actively. So it's an internal kind of prioritization exercise, but also very much listening to uh, to your suggestions. And I think the Community I Ideas Board is, a, is an ideal place for that. Bit of roadmap on architecture. So we have some firm commitments to do some work here. In which case, the uh, sorry, the first one being a move to an all new web client. So when I say web client, I'm, I mean the kind of traditional browser based tools for admin, for the folders, for the kind of configuration settings, translation jobs, and all of that kind of stuff. So move to a new web client, um, which is fundamentally driven by technical considerations to say we want to remove some of the older code uh, that's getting a bit dated, a bit harder to work with, takes us some time, and really move to kind of more cloud friendly, uh, scalable, modern, better performing code. Um, and this will also be the first customer, internal customer, if you like, for our new public API that we're working on as well. But with doing a new web client, you know, there will, of course, be a new UX. Um, if you've seen some of the progress with Tridian Sites, it's the same kind of design language there, many of the same components. So an all new, new UX, which I think is uh, many people will be looking forward to. A couple of other things, um, generally keeping working on that upgrade friendly and uh, simpler configuration type architecture, continuous progress here on that, moving towards more centralization, far fewer configuration files and so on. Just want to see if various people can see the slides. I'm it hearing looks, that at least. Mm -hmm. Looks good, Joe. That's fantastic. That's great. Super. OK. Um, and then finally, a, a really big piece um, that we are getting working on is what's called modern authentication, which to somebody who's not familiar with that term might say, well, you know, don't you have fairly modern authentication? Yes, we do. Modern with a small m. But this is when people say modern authentication capitalized, they mean a particular approach to this. It's not my sweet spot, but um, I'm convinced that this is absolutely what we need to do. Um, so, for example, to allow multi-factor authentication, uh, better cloud friendliness, and all sorts of good stuff like this. And built on an all new public uh, open API, which is easier to work with, self-documenting, and the thing that we, you know, people are generally moving to now. So the firm commitment. Um, and we are looking a little bit later out for that. Um, but when I say new public API, clearly we're eating our own dog food with the new web client on this. So it's not it's not like we're just testing it out in the wild for the first time then. Uh, lots of work going on this over the next couple of years. Roadmap also on connectors, something I haven't talked terribly much about. Um, so of course, for us, Trillion Docs old hands, you know, there are always the, um, we can connect to all sorts of things through the publishing pipeline. We can connect to all sorts of metadata sources through the metadata binding. But we're talking about just making a little bit more um, what you might call a kind of a robust, reproducible standard architecture for doing so. Um, because you can build all these connectors. Um, they tend to be ad hoc ones. So we want to do a little bit more out of the box here. And we'll focus first, I think, on publishing. So many people would like a smoother handover to systems, document management systems, where you might get e-signatures and documents and this kind of stuff. So systems of record, if you like, for finished outputs, or internets for a similar kind of purpose, or even knowledge bases, such as the Salesforce one. So we have all, already in the wider Tridian family, we have something called the Tridian Connector Framework, which uh, Tridian Sites has used a lot. And we will be plugging into that also for this functionality, which really provides sta stability, some guarantees, what happens if the thing you're publishing to is not available. You know, we're going to make sure that that's very smooth and tested and that we have standard ways of doing things um, and offering these plugins.
And then the final kind of big area, um, and it's got things which will come sooner and things which will come later, but a really kind of uh, a strategic focus for us, I would say, on the whole approach to, to the future of intelligent content. Because after all, Trillion Docs has been one of the leaders in this whole field of in intelligent content for many years. Uh, but the field is changing and we want to keep up with it and in indeed actually lead where, where people are going with that. So a few hints here. Again, some fairly information heavy slides, but I'm going to move fairly swiftly through so we have a good time for, for Q&A. But again, uh, please do check through later um, and let us know what you think. So quickly, just to indicate some of the scope, at least in terms of benefits for you, for you as customers, direct benefits. So we're looking again, of course, at the old thing of findability um, and connecting users in their journeys. And, you know, we've all been doing CMS for, for decades now, right? Um, and the findability thing still isn't quite cracked. Um, and one can chuck kind of a, a box, an enterprise search box at it or whatever. And, you know, it's always somehow dis, uh, dissatisfying. Um, so we have an approach to this, and I'll talk through it, that really helps make this whole findability experience a lot better. Always improving author and editor productivity, some, some specific ideas for that. Um, think about the future of delivery overall, how are we future ready, while not necessarily knowing exactly what, what, uh, how people will want to consume content in the future and what new platforms will come along for doing so, uh, making sure that we're prepared to do that. And then in terms of compliance and accuracy, uh, working on that, these are kind of key values for us, of course. So the whole Trillion Docs approach is about uh, knowing what you're doing and approving it and being very confident, having guarantees that all your content is valid and checked and good to go, but it, moving even further on that. And finally, a big focus on actually measuring the efficacy of all this, because we've traditionally been very good at um, kind of putting the pieces together efficiently and smoothly and getting them to different outputs. Um, and I think this applies again across CMS as a whole, um, actually measuring, is it doing the job you want to, it to do? Not just on kind of view counts, how many people are seeing this or whatever. They might all be coming to your page and, and hate it and you don't know. And, and so, you know, traditionally the various aspects of uh, looking at analytics have been limited and we have a new take on that. So I'm going to walk through that in a second. Just saying that this is all based on a kind of what we'd call a semantic AI approach. Um, Based on knowledge graph technology, which you may have heard of its previous iteration as linked data, it's all kind of different takes on the same thing. And the key point being that it's a way to connect data across reliably across different systems and understand how these different systems relate together, how the content relates to kind of ideas and objects in the real world, and how the content relates to other pieces of content. And ultimately, you know, to contrast this with the, the kind of recent popular approaches to, to kind of machine learning and full automation through AI and saying there is this is a more nuanced, nuanced take on that. So we've also heard the scare stories about kind of chatbots going rogue and producing offensive responses and all of this kind of stuff, which kind of goes to show in a small way what can happen if, if you if you go too automated. Um, so I think the whole point of this is that you have a foundation of a knowledge model which describes what you're doing and you get many, many different benefits from that. And Joe, Quick I kind wanna... of architectural diagram. Hello? Well, I'm sorry, I wanted to mm -hmm. add to this. This is a really interesting conversation because really we're hearing from SEL mm -hmm. customers. It's about relationships between content. And what we've learned really is that these relationships are very deep and very rich. And secondly, what you're talking about, Joe, is so critical for the consumers, whether they're customers, employees, partners, need to understand the source of content that's coming around. So really what you're talking about is very exciting because we're finally able to to create these these kind of knowledge graph relationships. Thank you, Chip. No, that's that's really useful. And yeah, it's something we've been hearing about for quite a while. So all these aspects um, are things that people are, are asking about actively. And so I won't go into great depth on this, but basically to say that 
the whole approach depends on the idea of kind of knowledge models mapping everything together. Not hugely different in some ways from the concept models that we've all worked with, but extending this further into the realms of taxonomy and kind of graph data as well, and saying it's uniting. This is not only a Trillion Docs thing, by the way. They're really looking across the Trillion product family and even wider and saying, how can we connect not only only our own tooling um, and more easily do smart apps that work better, uh, but also connect to external systems as well. So jumping directly into a few use cases, findability, the classic one. Um, and we all hear these stories, uh, which intuitively we know are true because we have bad kind of search experiences on a lot of platforms trying to find our content. And the benefits of this kind of knowledge model approach to it um, are that uh, you're looking not only for strings, which is the traditional limitation, but when you're searching for content, you're searching for ideas within the content. So I've got just a quick example here. of I'm looking for lung, um, and I'm not only finding things with that particular string, but also related concepts and ideas, not even just synonyms, but things that just make some conceptual sense if you're looking for information about lungs. Another thing that knowledge models enable um, is, is what I would call a connected user journey. And this is so, so important. So I think we're all, when we talk about search, we often think about the Siri or Alexa type experience. You ask a simple question, you get a single answer and you're happy. And of course, with the kind of content that a lot of our customers are working with, that's not going to work. You know, if you're installing a kind of a massive machine the size of a house, um, yes, Siri is not going to tell you the answer, <laughs> or at least it would take a long time to do so. Um, and similarly, you know, financial accounting information and so on, you need some depth to what you're finding and you need to relate together different resources. And it's not just going to be a snippet or even just one page that gives you the answer you're looking for. So we have to make a much more connected journey and make it easy for people to kind of jump through uh, different resources to find all the information they're looking for. And again, having a knowledge model behind it helps you. And it also um, lets you do so kind of smarter um, even kind of machine learning applications. So say you have personalization that gets better over time, but it's all backed by this knowledge model approach of understanding the relationships, again, between your content and the ideas and concepts that are important to your organization and, and your customers. Productivity, just quickly, I'll just focus on one aspect of this for now, but saying that, you know, we're talking about all this taxonomy stuff and relationships, which sounds grand, but are we just going to push all that effort onto authors? Um, and no, yes and no, but mostly no, in that, um, yes, there is still the responsibility for authors uh, to put in the tags, just as they always do when they're doing with data. Um, and even some taxonomy tags. Um, but we're working actively on a, um, right now it's a proof of concept stage, um, but it's scheduled for a next year release where we're actually uh, predicting the tags that you need to put into your content. And you can select the ones that make sense and deselect the ones that don't. So you're still in control, but the suggestions that we're getting so far are very helpful and accurate. And some of them are pretty much good to go as they are. Um, so pretty happy with this. Of course, if you're tagging everything, you can also easily find duplicate content. Now, we always say, of course, you shouldn't be writing too, too many similar topics. That's the whole point of data and single sourcing, but it happens. Um, and different teams create very similar things without knowing it, or they forget what they've done already. So this is going to be crucial in finding duplicate content, um, or even resources that could be useful to you in writing your current content and speeding up your whole authoring workflow. And a few other enhancements here as well, and we're talking more depth in a later session. Uh, but things around tracking the dependencies, so the relationships between bits of content, as Chip just mentioned, this is a crucial part of the picture to, to make sure you're getting some uh, the same guarantees that we've already always had on content and how it relates together, but faster and in a more visual way. And one of the really key parts to all of this is getting some insights. How am I performing? You know, is the content actually doing its job? Not only is it good to some abstract standard of quality, but, um, you know, are Joe, people happy I'm, with it? Yeah? I'm sorry, which slide are you on? Are they changing for the audience? 
So I'm on insights on investment and outcomes, and I see on the chat that yeah, some people are needing to refresh. So yeah, that probably would be an idea. It. Yeah, I'm not seeing refresh either. Okay. Can you click Jeffrey. the yellow button? Yellow, yellow buttons there. Yep, I'm going back and I'm going forward again, and I hope that changes. But if people are really having problems, then they might want to refresh the whole, the whole thing. I'm afraid. Thanks, Joe. Okay, but I would suggest, um, you know, from here on, it's mostly talking, so I think that's fine. Um, I'd suggest we, if we stick with it, and then of course we'll get to the questions and answers quite soon as well. Um, so just, I think people are looking for insights. Um, is my content doing the job it wants to do, it needs to do? Um, how can I get the most out of my resources for the bits that are not performing as well as they should be? How can I better use my limited resources to kind of meet customers' needs? Uh, we all have limited resources in terms of authoring, in terms of uh, capabilities. How can I best focus th those to do a better job? And ultimately, is the system paying for itself? So we can get the answers to these questions somehow, somehow using the same technology that we've just discussed for improving customer experience. I've gone on to the next slide now, just giving some examples to say, um, let's say your organization is providing professional health information and it's to provide doctors with all the information they need to diagnose a patient. So you might set a KPI. Um, generally speaking, if you're on a page and you're not getting the relevant links and previews and content on the page, if you have to bounce back to the site search, that's a bad experience. It's almost an indication of failure, I would say. And it's this is a standard kind of industry metric, I would say. Reduce this pogo sticking back to search, as they call it. So let's say this organization has a KPI to reduce this to under 20%. And then you will obviously get, when you measure that, um, you get some insights on that. You're going to find the problem pages, the problem areas. Uh, so you would want to look at those problem areas internally. You would want to get all the data from your kind of CMS to say, how much effort am I spending on these things? Are they going through the right, right workflow? Do they have the right metadata? Or am I simply not spending enough time writing the, the problem pages and I should revamp them a bit? And then, of course, you can prioritize your efforts and, and remeasure and make sure you're now doing the job. So very briefly, this the innovations here are in terms of connecting everything, connecting bits of data. Because, of course, there are tools that will give you various bits of the picture. You have analytics tools to tell you your page views, where do we think people are when they're viewing the content, etc. But it tells you nothing about how effective that content really was. It doesn't even tell you a lot about uh, what people were searching for, typically. So you get search analytics as well, which gives you different insights into people's intention when they're looking for content. Separately, you get qualitative data, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. If you didn't like it, uh, why not? And you can do sentiment analysis on this. And then finally, the internal data I mentioned to say how much time and effort are you spending? And then which pages is do you have, but nobody's actually seeing because that data doesn't show up anywhere else except in your CMS typically. So we need to combine all of these bits of data um, with a kind of aggregated holistic insights tool. And this is what we're actively working on. As I indicated with the banner, it's not kind of very near term stuff, but it's in the kind of medium term future and it's kind of an active development and it stems exactly from the earlier, more near term features that I talked about around findability and such like. And then just fight the final piece of this kind of strategic vision, if you like, on, on high for content, on semantic AI, is just to say once you've got this intelligence in your content, um, it prepares you far better for whatever delivery platforms we need to um, satisfy in the, in the future. However customers want to access content, we need to be ready for that. And this is really the way to do it. You know, having Ditter is the first great step because you've chunked up your content into useful little chunks. This semantic aspect is the, is the next big leap forward. To say, I truly understand how to match users' intents with the content that I have. So that's a glimpse into the future there. And then back into the, the much nearer future, what's coming directly next? So I'm now on a roadmap slide for Tridian Docs 15, which we're targeting around mid next year, I would say, mid 2021. 
And it's pr pretty much the things that I indicated. So this next generation web client interface, new UX, but of course the new backend, the new architecture um, to make it much more efficient, to make it work better in the clouds, to make it behave nicer on your on-premise installations and everything and more upgrade friendly. The taxonomy capabilities I've just mentioned, along with the enhanced findability, the publishing connectors I mentioned as well. This is going to improve a lot of people's lives. And in terms of general connectors, this is just the start because there are many other types of connectors that we'll be looking into as well. And then finally, those collective spaces enhancements that I mentioned. Uh, very actively looking into prioritizing what comes next on that. And please do send your feedback to us on that ideas forum. So as a final wrap up, things to do next, we've just published a series of six uh, kind of training videos on the community actually called bootcamp videos. This is kind of the in-depth training that we always used to do internally for our folks. And we thought, well, why not let everybody see it? You know, it goes fairly technical, um, fairly deep, fairly quickly. Um, but I think this will be useful to many customers. So I do welcome you to go on the community, watch those and, and do comments. There'll be um, indications too of, of where to post in the forums uh, with any feedback there. So watch those. Do contact your account manager to discuss the upgrade to Tridian Docs 14 SP2 and do join in those discussions. Chip, anything else you would add there? Yes, Joe, thank you. I um, would also encourage uh, folks to go to community.scl.com for the forums and conversations that go on there. Uh, there are deeper uh, recordings from uh, Nigel on my team uh, for collective spaces. If you want a deeper dive on draft space, review space, they're also on the community. Um, and Joe, you also mentioned a good point earlier. It's There's the ideas page in the community. If you have suggestions for new features, please post them in the ideas page. Um, it's a pretty exciting area. Um, and finally, we also have our documentation page. So if you go to docs.scl.com, you'll find the release notes for Trading Docs 14 Service Pack 2. So Joe, excellent webinar. There are a few questions to ask you, and, and I've been kind of answering them in the chat window. So um, one question is really is about, you know, the license model for collective spaces. How does that work, mm -hmm. Joe? I know it's a concurrent user role, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that. No, sure. I, I, I mean, that that's the essence of it. it it's a concurrent user model because, um, you know, oftentimes when you're talking about SMEs, it is people who won't always be uh, solidly on the system um, most of the time. It's something they're going to dip into and dip out of. Certainly for reviewers, you know, review cycles may only come around uh, sometimes for them, but also for SME authors, you know, if if they're a full-time engineer, and they're just sometimes writing content, um, then you don't really want to use up a, a full-time kind of named license for them. So the concurrent user model makes it a lot more flexible in, in that regard. Um, is that helpful, Chip, do you think? Very perfect. One, one last thing, it also kind of a follow the sun kind of model. Uh, many of our customers have folks in Europe who could use these licenses. And then as North America starts working and Europe goes home, well, people don't go home anymore right now, but if they stop working, and then also in Asia. So there's a lot of flexibility in the, in the license model. So that, that's great, Joe. A second question is around the configurability of collective spaces. And this is something relatively recent that came out in terms mm -hmm. of pack one, but, but a lot of times, you know, oh, data specializations and, you know, the look and feel, Joe, what, what kind of configurations can, uh, can SDL provide our customers? Mm -hmm. No, it's a really good question. Um, and it, it's an insightful question because the great kind of UX that you do get in collective spaces, there's a lot that goes to make that up. So I think something we were trying to avoid was the kind of like it's completely a toy box and you can do whatever you want and build your own tool out of it because then we simply wouldn't be able to give you the same good user experience, upgradability and, and support and so on. Nevertheless, it's vitally important that, for example, people can support their data specializations, as you mentioned, their different structures, the templates and so on. 
also, of course, that it picks up on their, their workflows, their customized workflows, which it absolutely does. It's built straight on the CM, and, and so it picks up on the workflows as well. Um, and we are looking into this area in terms of, I mean, I encourage people to, as I say, watch these boot camp sessions, which go into quite some depth on exactly how to configure it and what's configurable. And I would welcome further feedback on that as well. You know, is it kind of more custom menus, hiding things in menus, uh, whatever it may be, that would be great to hear more about. But I think at the moment, it's a good balance of really supporting people's um, you know, specialization needs, workflow needs, all that kind of thing, um, while keeping that kind of good quality design and, and user experience. And thanks, Joe. One of the things that, a few things I'll add is, number one is the properties dialogues for customers who you see using our, uh, the client tools. The properties align 100% with collective spaces. So we, SDL now single source, the configuration or known as the list of values. Um, and what was new with Treating Docs 14 is the ability to hide some of those fields from an SME. So for the professional authors using Oxygen or Xmetal, there could be a larger list and for the SMEs, it could be a smaller list, but it's a single configuration as Joe mentioned, that's been greatly uh, unified within uh, upgrades and so forth. The other thing you saw in my brief demo was the workflow statuses um, also align. And finally, the templates. So when you go to create new topics and so forth, those also align with the same topic uh, templates that are used in uh, Oxygen and XMetal. So I think we have time for one last question, Joe. There's a, there's a great question about videos. You know, how, you know, and essentially I know within Draft Space we can create links to videos and so forth. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, how, how do we do that within, uh, within draft space? Right. Um, so I think very, very much depends on where you, the application and where you're publishing to them and how you want them to show up, I would say. So this thing in, in Tridian Docs and in Ditto overall is always somewhat implementation specific. Right. Some people are hosting their own videos, for example. Others just want to have an embed from, you know, YouTube or Vimeo or wherever it may be. Okay, so it's, I, and I don't want to kind of a, avoid questions in any sense, but it's something that, you know, should not be, We I don't want to lock down the way that people do this because there are different ways that people would need it, to do it, if that I makes think, sense. Yeah, I assume most of them are hosted. So they're on a, on a digital asset management system or YouTube, mm -hmm. assume that. So then you basically create a link within your mm -hmm. data XML to that external, uh, that external uh, video. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And when you're setting up your information architecture, you can think of, do I even want to specialize an element to make those embeds a little bit easier? Um, right. And that's exactly what you would do. You would treat it as an external reference. Um, now, typically, you don't you don't want a ton. And this is very standard, of course, among, among DITA uh, kind of overall data concept management, uh, you don't want to be putting like very large binary files into your CMS because it's not supposed to be a generic document management system and uh, it will, you need to be able to manage your data in there. That That's what it's for. So the ideal approach is the kind of decoupled approach that uh, Chip is, is suggesting here, which is you do external references. And this is of course a best practice across the in industry that you use by reference, if you like, instead of uh, literal embeds there. Great, Joe. You know, and there's one last question around the the new web client that's planned for 2021. Mm -hmm. That's not replacing mm -hmm. Publication Manager, of course, but maybe if you could just confirm no. that. No, I, I confirm that. Yes, very much Excellent. so. No, Publication yeah. Manager has a has a solid job to do, and it's it's yes. not going away at all. Yeah, Correct. Absolutely. Correct. And the new web client will help in our SMEs and other aspects and so forth with a modern design UX. So perfect. So, mm -hmm. okay. Well, Joe, thank you very much. Jeffrey, we're done. I think we can wrap up. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Chip and Joe. Very, very exciting stuff. Uh, and thank you all for attending the webinar. Uh, today's recording will be available here on On24 shortly. 
but we will also send a copy to everyone who registered. The recording will also be on our SDL community. We hope you found today's session useful, and we look forward to seeing you again on one of our next webinars. Have a great rest of your day.